sacrificially and in obedience. I just love that. Uh, I want you to take a journey with me. I want you to imagine there's a a father, and he's walking with his son on a journey. And while they are on their way, they happen upon a strawberry patch. They get to the strawberry patch, and the father, he bends down, he picks up a strawberry, and he takes a bite. Then he bends down, he picks up another strawberry, he gives it to his son. The son takes a bite, and he sees that it's good, it's delicious, it's wonderful. They spend some time talking about strawberries in the patch, but time goes on, and eventually they leave. And they get to the point where they no longer have to go to the strawberry patch to get strawberries. In fact, other people will go for them. They'll even chop those strawberries up. They'll put them in different things like fruit cake and fruit salad. Then it goes into a laboratory, right? And they find new ways to just kind of make it not so much the strawberry anymore. Where we've got things like strawberry extract and the essence of strawberry for things like strawberry (laughs) Pop-Tarts. Then they get to a point where they can give strawberry flavor without actually putting any strawberry in it. The father every day brings his son to the store and they get a strawberry slush that he thinks is delicious but doesn't actually have any strawberry inside of it. And they spend the next few years doing that every day thinking very little about the strawberry patch. Finally one day they go on a journey again and they happen again upon a strawberry patch. The father bends down, he picks up a strawberry, gives it to his son, his son takes a bite And he doesn't like the taste because it doesn't taste like the strawberry slush that he loves so much. A strawberry slush that doesn't actually have any strawberry in it. This is an illustration that's often used by pastors to to highlight postmodernism. It's this idea how we kind of water down the gospel and then we water down the gospel and then we water it down more until it becomes something completely other than it was ever meant to be. But I also think that this is a really clear illustration of our roles in our homes as we are the primary disciples of our kids. See, where we go, there are tiny feet that follow. Like where we go, there are people that we are leading, and it's our responsibility in our homes to understand that our kids were made for strawberries. Like they were made for an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus. They were made for the real thing, one that is not actually sustained by your relationship with Jesus. It starts that way, but it's meant to become their own. And here's the thing, the only way that our kids are going to learn to love strawberries, the only way they're going to have their own relationship that we can actually disciple them into a relationship with Jesus is by getting to the strawberry patch, leading them to where they need to go. See, it's very easy for us to say, yeah, that sounds good, and then to trade it in for lesser things. You know what I mean? Like our schedule kind of just fills up. We're supposed to lead our schedule, but a lot of times our schedule leads us. And so then quiet time with God gets swallowed up by soccer games and cheer practice. Intimate worship where the family can actually see each other worshiping together and praising God gets swallowed up by other priorities that are lesser than. And we get consumed by things that were never meant to have our hearts. And just like that, we're no longer in the strawberry patch. Just like that, we're not inviting them into the relationship that we have with Jesus. Instead, we've stepped aside and traded it for lesser things. Here's the hard part. See, most of us uh, would agree with this. We'd be like, yeah, I understand my role is to disciple my kids. Here's the problem. I wasn't discipled by my parents. Like, what does it look like for me to lead my kids to a place that I don't know that my parents ever led me? Here's the thing. There is a difference between not knowing and not going. Like, just because you don't know what it looks like to get there doesn't mean that you don't Lead them there. In fact, if you are here and have your own personal relationship with Jesus, and if you don't, I just want to say, I'm stoked you're here. Like, this is a place, like like Pastor Brian was talking about, we want you to pray God show up. Because God, when we say show up, he shows off. And he shows and reveals himself to us in beautiful ways. But if you've got a relationship with Jesus, you've already been to the strawberry patch. All you have to do is invite them to where you already are. Invite them into the relationship that you have. See, we're uh, diving into a series uh, called Family Meeting. If you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you to open up to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And we're in this series right now uh, where we're kind of together. Maybe it's not even a series. Maybe it's actually a family meeting where, you know, mom and dad, they sit down and they're like, hey, son, hey, daughter. Like, you're with your siblings. You guys are looking around like, what happened? Like, what did we do? And dad's like, hey, we're going to reorient ourselves back to where we were meant to be. We're going to have a conversation about shifting back to that type of garden living that our family was always meant to take part in. We're meant 
to live in the strawberry patch and have said, hey, this is a meeting to reorient what has been missing, left astray, and has drifted. We're going to have a family meeting. And today we are talking about parenting. Last week we talked about marriage. And here's what I want you to know about parenting. Because a lot of times we're like, hey, this is just for you who are old enough to have small kids in your home. And it's not. Listen, if you are a parent of a child, you're expecting or you're trying. This applies directly to you. And if you are a disciple of Jesus, Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations. That means you are meant to be a spiritual parent to somebody. And if we take that mission seriously, then this message also applies to you. A.K.A. Not one of us can check out. This message is for us. Deuteronomy chapter 6, it goes like this. It says, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So there's a promised land. They're about to go there, but they need to hold on to his law, he's saying, so that what happens? Your children, their children, after them may fear the Lord your God. That word fear, we talked about it last week. It's talking about a reverent respect. Fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Here's what Moses is saying. He's saying, hey, cling on to what is good and true and it's just going to be better for you. There's just something that's going to happen in your family that's going to help you. And I'm not talking about the physical things down here. I'm talking about an eternal perspective that's going to lead us into a heart shift that leaves this world into a physical shift that looks radically different than it does today. There's an invitation here. And what Moses is saying, hey, don't take my word for it. Don't take your pastor's word for it. Listen, I've got a six-year-old and a one-year-old. Ninety percent of you have more parenting experience than I do. I'm building the plane while flying here. What he's saying is you don't need to take my word for it. We're going to take his. Like we're going to look at the book. We're going to see what God has to say about our parenting. And he's going to invite us into that. Now, One thing I just want to hash out real quick. Because there's any number of parenting strategies out there right now. You could literally go to a bookstore. And if you just grab a random book, you've got like a 10% chance of getting a parenting book. Because we're all just trying to figure it out. What I'm not going to do today is walk through a ton of different holistic parenting strategies. And act like this is going to solve all your parenting woes. Here's the deal. God didn't use a cookie cutter when he printed your kids out. Like, they are all unique and different. They are special, which means that they need to be addressed in a unique way. Like, I can't give you the secret sauce, and Chick-fil-A would have to do that. I can't give that to you. But instead, what I can do is I can point to truth and say what's real. The, the reality is, some of us, it, it almost seems like our kids came out smoking a pipe and reading the New Testament. And others, it feels like, man, like they're going to, this is a little bit tougher. This is harder. Some kids need extreme gentleness because anything more than that is going to crush their spirit. And some need firm boundaries. Otherwise, they're going to light the Western Hemisphere on fire. Every kid is different, but there are some truths that we can stand on and lean on. And Moses is saying, hey, cling on to that. Cling on to what is true because that's going to help us disciple our, our kids. Verse 3, it says, hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. I tried to find a translation that subbed out milk and honey for strawberries. It does not exist, and you should be sketched out if it did. The idea here, he's saying, hey, listen, this is going to be good for you, not just you, but this is good for your family. Your family is going to increase. There's things that are going to happen within your home that are so beautiful that you could never even expect. But guess what? You need the power of God in it, which means you need to be dead center of the strawberry patch. You need to be caught up in your relationship with Jesus. The next five verses, and this is where we, I know we, I kind of like fast track this a little bit, but the next five verses is where we're really setting up camp. Uh, and the next five verses are known as the Shema. Now, the Shema is a prayer that was spoken uh, over the Israelites. They would pray it every single day, which means they had it memorized. It was like the John 3.16 of the Old Testament, except it was more like the Matthew 28. See, Matthew 28, that's where we get our mission statement. We exist to make and send disciples who love and live like Jesus. That's where we get it. It's the commissioning that Jesus gave us before he ascended. And yet, discipleship is not a New Testament idea. It's a New Testament word, but it's a practice that we see very much all throughout the story. And so here we see in the Shema what it looks like to disciple our families and the commission that God has given us as disciple makers. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And you're like, Josh, I'm with you, but what on earth does that have to do with parenting? 
point here is, is, is Moses is saying, hey, listen, there's two sections to this parenting conversation. In the same way that we had two sections last week when we talked about marriage, where we, in our marriages, we've got problems, and we're like, oh, man, it's all their fault. And the reality is, no, 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 you were given a magnifying glass to look into your own heart, that you can address your own sin, that you can grow and mature as a disciple, and hopefully lead your family into that as well. There's two parts to this, and Moses is saying, hey, we're going to focus on your kids. We're going to focus on what they need, but first we need to focus on you. In other words, you have to lead yourself. If you want to lead your family, you have to lead yourself. And so many times we become these individuals that are just like, man, like they're just not going where I want them to go. Like they're just not following where I'm trying to lead them. And God's saying, no, 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 get yourself right first. Sometimes in God's grace, he actually gives us resistance in our families to them following us because we haven't gotten our stuff together. Now, that's not an excuse. They should follow. But the reality is if I don't work on me first, I'm missing it. And he said, hey, the Lord our God is one. In other words, he said, hey, everything that follows is built on this. It's him and nothing else. There's not a hierarchy in our lives that has anything but God at number one. Like he is the center of our universe. And you might be like, Josh, I get that. Like that makes total sense. Like I understand that God is meant to be number one. Okay, I, I'm with you. But let's go ahead and let's fact check it really quick. Because this is often how we view our relationships. We say, okay, well, my relationships, like, it's a finite amount of time, and so it's, like, kind of like a pie chart, you know? And so, so I've got uh, time for, well, i got work, so work's kind of a big thing. What are, what are some of the other things we do? We've got work, what else? Hobbies. Man, that bowling league, love it. What else? What about your wife and kids, hopefully? So you got time for your spouse? Yacht. Kids? I'm ignoring the God one right now. Sleep? You're ruining my metaphor. <laughs> Sleep. And hey, here's the fun part about rest is like it feels like the more kids you have, the more rest you need and the less of a slice of pie you get. Then you go, oh, I need food. And then most of us, here's our response. Oh, shoot, I forgot about God. And we give God our leftovers, right? We say, oh, you know what, I'm going to just kind of squeeze you in where it works. And so maybe it's a five minutes on the drive, maybe I'll pray to you, or maybe it's grace before a meal, or maybe uh, if I get to that devotion in the morning, I'll do that. And we view our relationships like a pie chart, and this is what it's saying. It says, no, 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 the Lord our God is one. He doesn't get the leftovers. He gets first and best. In other words, can you guys see this podium in the way? We're just going to make it work. This is the God circle. And everything else in our life falls in. Work. Spouse. Which should be a bigger circle than your kids. Everything else is invited into that relationship. But we view it like a pie chart. We say, no, no, I've only got so much time. And God's saying, no, 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 you miss it every time that you've got. Every minute you have on this earth and every minute you have after this earth. He's saying, it's all mine. The Lord, our God, is one. And if we're going to invite our kids into the relationship that we have, it better not look like a piece of a strawberry pie. Instead, it's meant to be the whole thing, the whole lot. It's everything. So here's the problem is you can't lead your kids to a place that you never visit. You can't say, hey, that strawberry patch is really cool. They see it. It's not what we are taught in. It's what we're caught in, right? Like it's the way we live out our lives in such a way where they say, man, you know what? He loves him. He really believes this stuff that he's saying about Jesus. He's really caught up in that. I see him in the word. I see him doing all that. In fact, I'm invited into that process. Parents, we have to not just model it for our kids, but we got to live it out. Because, yeah. <laughs> Jacob, I love you. Because your kids weren't the only ones made for strawberries. You were made for strawberries. You were made for an intimate relationship with Jesus, and we're not supposed to miss it. Verse 5, it continues, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And a, a lot of times we'll break this apart and we'll be like, hey, what does strength mean? And what, is, what does heart mean? What is it, what is this mean? But really what it's saying is it's saying every ounce of you, like everything that you've got is supposed to kind of, overflow this love that you have. Like, what love have you ever experienced that doesn't overflow? I'll tell you what it's not. It's not love. Like, love is extreme. Love is risky. Love is dangerous. Love is something that calls you to places, like Brian was talking about, that he never ex uh, ex expected to go. Like, it's an invitation into something unique and altogether different. Love is meant to change everything. And that's the kind of love that we are supposed to have. See, there's this uh, phenomenon that happens. Like, babies are fascinating. My daughter has been 
teaching me things about Jesus well before she could ever speak. And there's a phenomenon that happens with babies. If you have a baby, uh, if you have a friend who has a baby, if you've ever seen a baby, or if you've watched a movie with a baby in it, you know what I'm talking about. Here's how it works. Mom or dad, they're holding their, their baby boy or daughter. And everything is right with the world. And a friend comes by and says, hey, like, your, your baby is so calm. Like, man, can I hold him? And this is a trusted friend. Like, strangers stop grabbing babies. But this is a trusted friend. And you go, yeah, absolutely you can hold him. He's so calm. And you hand your baby over. And what happens? Anarchy, right? Like, this child loses their mind. They're like, you don't smell right. You don't sound right. You don't feel right. Your heart beats too fast. Like, they're like... This is not where I'm meant to be. They're like, I have to get back to the place that I know and love. I have to get back to where I'm safe. That's how we're supposed to feel when we leave the garden. Like when we leave our fellowship with God, when we sidestep and say, hey, I'd re- rather than being obedient to your call in my life, I'm going to go this way. Rather than doing what you've called me to, I'm going to do this hidden sin that nobody else knows about, so it probably doesn't affect all that much. I'm going to go my own way. And we sidestep the garden, we step out of the strawberry patch, and we go somewhere else. And yet, we're supposed to respond like a baby. But we're supposed to say, no, 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 like, I just got to get back, man. Like, I just got to get back to, like, I I can't believe I got over here. I want to get back to where I was always meant to be. Here's the thing, though. What happens as you practice handing your child off to people? You go to kids' ministry. They've got daycare. You've got friends who hold them. What begins to happen? They start to get used to it. Now, parents, sigh of relief. That's a good thing. Like, we want that. We need rest. We need a break. But when it comes to our intimate relationship with Jesus, we also get used to it where we step away from him and we get used to being away from him and then we get convinced that we don't need him anymore. And sometimes we forget altogether who we were called to be. And this is a reminder, no, 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 like as we step away and we go to the big Y Pop-Tart aisle and grab that strawberry Pop-Tart, you were made for something better. You were made for an intimate relationship with Jesus that is altogether yours and unique. The problem is that when we sidestep our relationship with Jesus, it becomes very normal. So I'll ask, uh, I'll ask a question of people as I'm walking beside them. It's a question that's not unique. It's not novel. There's nothing special about it. I didn't make it up. Uh, and it goes like this. How are you and Jesus? And nine out of ten times, the answer that I get is, we're good. And ten out of ten times, I respond, I don't know what that means. And that's not me being harsh. It's just saying, like, I don't know what good means. Because a lot of times when we say good, what we really mean is normal. And I don't know if normal is the center of the strawberry patch where you are caught up in who he is and on fire for the Lord. Or if it's three miles down the road. I don't know what that is. And together we need to unpack that. It's just like, man, like, I want what actually is good. And what is good isn't necessarily what's normal for me right now. Sometimes we need to look down at our feet, see where we stand, and say, no, 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 I need to get back to the garden. Like, I need to get back to that relationship that I was never meant to sidestep and go away from. There's an invitation in here. Parents, as we lead our families, you have to lead yourself. Here's the trouble. I am not gifted enough as a communicator to convince you to fall in love with anybody. I love Moe's burritos. I'm not proud of it, but I do. And I could describe a Moe's burrito to you. I could be like, hey, listen, like, man, like, this burrito is so good. I would put steak in it, queso on the inside. If you're not a pro, pro tip, you should do that. Get some sour cream. Get a little bit of lettuce because I'm not here to play games. Like, I'm going to set this thing up. And that's going to be good. And you might be like, Josh, that sounds disgusting. Or you might be like, hey, Josh, that sounds pretty good. But I'll tell you what you're not. You're not in love with it. You don't love it. Why? Because you've got to taste and see. Like, you're not going to fall in love until, until you take a bite. And the reality is, I can describe God's character to you all day. But until you taste and see that the Lord is good, all I can do is point. That's the garden. That's where he is. This is what a relationship with God where we say the Lord our God is one and everything in me, every ounce of me is drawn back to him because he's got my heart, he's got my love, he's got my everything. And our kids, they see it and they see what we are caught in, not what they're taught in. We can give them all the right words and have a practice that is completely separate. But God doesn't divorce the methods from the message. He says, no, 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 I tell you what to do and I also show you how to live it out. Be in love with me and it will change everything. It says, these commandments I give you today are to be written on your hearts. 
And there's a word in there that I want to just hyper-emphasize really quick, and it's the word your. This doesn't say, hey, the, these words are meant to be written on your pastor's heart. It doesn't say, hey, this is meant to be written on your spouse's heart who gets theology a little bit more than you do. This doesn't say, write it on the heart of your neighbor who invited you to church. No, no, it says, whose heart? Your heart. Like every single one of us as a disciple of Jesus, we're meant to have this wrapped up in our heart that it is tattooed on our chest that we are caught up in who God is. And the problem is that we usually start out not fully understanding, and what we do is we defer our role. You ever see that where we see somebody stand up on stage, you see the pastor stand up on stage, and we just take his word for it. Listen, you shouldn't take my word for it. Everything we do should be pushed through a filter. We exist to make and send disciples who love and live like Jesus. That's the filter of our church. Everything that we do, if it's a yes that can help us make and send disciples, then we might do it. If it's a no, it doesn't, then we will not do it. In the same way, we need to have a filter as parents to understand what does it look like for us to kind of push things through to say, no, 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 like my love for God is going to come first. My love for him is going to come first, and he's going to be the filter by which I offer myself through. Too often we don't have a filter to push through. So we don't know what's true, and so we just trust the person talking from a stage. Your family is too important to just take my word for it. Like, you have to understand his word. That way, when I'm speaking, and you say, mm, that's from the Lord, that's good. And that's Josh, that's not good. Let's talk to him about it. And listen, I have a healthy expectation that if I say something that's not true, that you come up to me and you correct me. Because I'm still broken on this journey, too, trying to figure this out. We are on a mission together to follow the Lord. See, as parents, we've got a responsi responsibility to no longer be biblically illiterate Christians. And I say that without any shame. Listen, every single believer in here, whether they've been serving the Lord for 80 years or they just turned their life over to him during worship today, every single one of us started there. But we didn't understand the word, didn't know what it looked like, didn't know how to follow, and someone walked beside us and showed us the way. There's not shame in that. There's just a requirement or at least a healthy biblical expectation that I have for you that we're not going to stay there. That you're going to be able to push it through the filter of God's word and say, hey, this is true and this is good. And this is not sand, but it's a hard rock I can stand on that when the wind comes and the waters rise, I'm going to stand firm. Because my faith is built on something. And guess who is there with you? Tiny feet. Right beside you following where you lead. But that's enough about you. Let's talk about your kids. Continues, it says, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. And that word impress, what it's saying is that you are the mold by which your, your kids are shaped in. And you might be like, well, that didn't happen for me. Like, I, I, I went a different way. You see, like, my parents were so rough that I actually made an effort not to be like them. That's fine, but you became a mold of somebody. See, here's the challenge, and this should hopefully create a tension in our hearts, is that your kids weren't just made for strawberries, they were also made to be disciples. Which means that if you don't, someone else will. If you don't, someone else will become that mold that you were meant to be. And I don't want my kid to be molded by TV or pop culture. And I'm not saying any of that stuff is bad, although <laughs> I'm going to call it 99% bad. I'm just saying that there's something way better and that you were meant to be that mold. And they're meant to be impress impressions of you. Why? Because you're an image of God. You were made in the image of God, and so were they. And they're being raised up in that family. And if you're in the center of the garden, it's going to be a lot easier to show them the mold that they were designed to be. Parents, we need to get healthy and make sure we're leading to the right places. What Moses says here, I love this. He's like, hey, wherever you're going, uh, go intentionally. I think that's the, the struggle that we get into as parents is a lot of times we get these kids, they show up. They don't show up with a tutorial. They don't have like a print out manual of like, hey, this is what you need to do to make sure this, this kid stays alive and actually has a biblical understanding of the world. They, they don't come that way. And so we, we wrestle through like, what does it look like to lead them to a place? And here's the thing. Most parents don't have a destination we're leading our kids to. And that's what I want to wake us up to a little bit is we need to be headed somewhere. Now, the destination that Jenny and I have set up is, is three parts. We want our kids to love God, want them to love others, and we want them to enjoy us in that order. We want them to, to be caught up in the garden where they're like, man, like Jesus is number one. I love who he is, and I'm all about what he is doing. I want to care for the people around me. Oh, yeah, and when they don't have to, I want them to choose to 
spend time with us. That's our goal, and everything we do is pushed through that filter. We want them to love God, love others, and enjoy us. And Moses is saying, well, while you're driving on that destination, uh, talk about it. It's like, hey, like, as you sit down, as you walk, as you move around, as you lay down, as you stand up, I want you to talk about who God is. In other words, he says, hey, I want you to play I Spy. And your kids are genetically wired for this game. You didn't even have to teach them. I'm bad at finding things. My daughter is trying to teach me how to find things. And I Spy, if you've never played it, which I'm sure you have, you describe something, they try to find it. And Moses is saying, listen, his fingerprints are everywhere. Like, God's all over the place. Like, like, look for him and then find him. Here's the thing, though. It's going to be really hard to find him if he's just the leftovers on a pie chart. But when he is everything, when the center of your being is shifted into who he is. You know where it's easy to find a strawberry? The strawberry patch. You're going to see his fingerprints and you're going to see who he is and you're going to see what he's doing. Uh, my daughter is someone that I play I Spy with all the time. Uh, one of the ways uh, that we did it was a couple years ago. We were talking about uh, the Miami Dolphins. That's my favorite football team, and therefore it is her favorite football team because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. <laughs> Just kidding. Lisa's out. Just kidding. But she loves uh, the Dolphins. So we were talking about how the Dolphins had cheated. Uh, and I was like, baby, there's going to be some consequences. We're losing some draft picks. She has no idea what I'm talking about. But she's asking some questions. She says, okay, well, Dad, why did they cheat? I thought about it and said, well, they wanted to win more than they wanted to do what was right. And then she asks, why? And just like that, we're not talking about football anymore. See, I, I, I don't know the GM. I don't, I don't know what his mindset was, what his motivations were. But I do know a whole lot about sin. I do know a whole lot about my desperate need for a savior, how every single one of us falls short. Everything, every single one of us chooses to win over doing what's right. Every single one of us misses it. And so we started talking about it. We could have talked about football, but instead we played I Spy. It was an invitation to talk about the most important relationship we have. And here's the fun part, is as we play this game with our kids, they start to play back. I kid you not, this happened uh, two Fridays ago, right before I started working on this message. I'm driving Lilla to school on a Friday morning, uh, and I ask her a question, because I just love to ask questions. Hey, who is your best friend right now? And she says, Dad, you're one of my best friends, but God is my real best friend, and he's way better than you are. I'm, I, I'm waiting to get the mug on Father's Day, second best dad. <laughs> and that's what winning looks like. Like my daughter is saying, no, no, like, like, I spy, like you're good, but he's better. It's a reminder of where we stand in the great perspective of things, that he is the one that we all so desperately need. As we play I spy with our kids, they start playing with us back. And that is a huge win for any parent. It continues says, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on, this is his commands, right? Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And this was a literal practice back in the day. They had like Old Testament fanny packs that they would put on their head or on their wrist. And it had scripture in it or they would write like parchment on the door and they put it on the door frame. And that was set up as a reminder because most of us, at least I do, I've got this thing called Christian amnesia where I'm very quick to forget who I'm meant to be following. And I could love God and I can play I Spy and I can get caught up in all the things that I'm supposed to. But when I drift, I need something external to remind me to reorient myself back to where I was meant to be the whole time, to go back to the strawberry patch. We see a picture of this in Joshua 4. It's around the same timeline, timeline of Deuteronomy where the Israelites are about to go into the promised land. And God says this to his people. He says, pass on before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of the Jordan. Take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. God says, take these stones. How many stones? Well, you're going to take 12 stones because there's 12 tribes. And you're going to set them up as a memorial to what? To what God did. See, he doesn't just part seas. He stops rivers. And they walked across on dry land. He said, hey, when you walk by this, your kids are going to ask about it. 
And when they see that external reminder, it's a reminder for you, too, of what God is doing, what God has done, and what he continues to do as we move forward on mission with him. That God is good, and he invites us into the strawberry patch every second of every day of our lives if we choose to go there. So for us, as, as a body of believers, we need external reminders in our homes to set up reminders for ourselves, to reorient when we drift, because drift is natural. That's the current of this world, but it's not an excuse to continue drifting down the river. Saying, hold on, he stopped the river. I'm not meant to drift anymore. I'm meant to walk forward into the land of promise, a relationship that's not just promised for me, but that my kids are invited into as well, and I am the mold. So I wanted to give you some practical reminders that my family has set up and some of the things that maybe you could do or you could do something different. Listen, this isn't about what stone we use and what stone you should use. It's about setting up reminders that are specific enough to you to remind you of what God has done and is doing. One of the reminders that we have set up is when we have dinner, we ask a question. We say, hey, where did you see Jesus today? We play I Spy. If you have been a guest in our home for dinner, you may have experienced this question. Lilla loves it. She'll answer. We'll all answer. She'll even answer for the dogs. She'll answer for the cat. Although I'm convinced that cats do not know Jesus. <laughs> We're playing I Spy together as a reminder of the stones of what God has done in our, our lives. One of the other things that we do is we have on Friday mornings I drive her to school because we stop and have a quiet time together. We go to a coffee shop. She gets a coffee, uh, a coffee cake. We sit down and we do the word. We've been doing this since she was three. Now, it looks radically different when it's a three-year-old. But we'd sit down. We would read her kid's Bible. She just upgraded to a real Bible this year. She'll draw a picture of what happened, and we'll talk about a phrase that maybe God is speaking to her, and then we'll keep checking in throughout the week of, hey, how's this going? When God says, hey, God loves you big, like how is that reminding you in times where you are afraid of his love? When, when God says, hey, love your friends well, what does, that, what does that look like? How did you care for your friends today? Well, I asked their favorite Keller. That's awesome. Gives us things to point to with our, our kids. One of the other things, uh, and this isn't written, so I'm going off script a little bit, but is serving with our kids. Like setting up reminders in our schedules. We just talked about street church where it's an opportunity for us to be able to go into our community and say, hey, no, no, I'm going to give back. It's not just about what I get. It's about what I can offer and saying, hey, it's not just me, but I got tiny feet with me because we're about the strawberry patch here and we know you're about the strawberry patch here. And so let's bring the strawberry patch here. Saying, God, you are good and you are big and we've got you. You're everything to us. The Lord our God is one. See, this is far less about creating a, a plan on how do I parent my kid and what do I need to do. And it's far more about inviting them into the life that you already have. Jesus has changed, hopefully, everything for you. And he can change it for them, too. As our worship team comes forward... I want to cast a little vision on what we're about to do. See, we're going to have a time of worship response, but it's going to be a little bit different in the sense that this song is actually being prayed over you. It's a chance for us to say, hey, this is a healthy biblical expectation that we have for our families here. And so if you are with your family, I just ask that you worship together. Uh, kids, if you are with your parents, you can put a hand on their shoulder. Grandparents, if you're there, you can pray downward too on your kids. Like you can do it however you need, but we are praying over the families here. Say, God, like you are big and you are good and you are mighty and you are strong. And you've got a direction for our homes that is beautiful and unexpected. And it looks like a strawberry patch. And so, Lord, get us back to the garden. Jesus, we love you. We praise your name that you are a God that meets us in our mess. That you don't, you don't need us to be on the best, best soil to plant some strawberries. And so, Lord, we just ask that you... Grow our fellowship with you, that we aren't just people who claim you in our words, but our deeds and our hearts have you filled up in. That you are every bit to us, the one that we pursue. You are the one, the center of everything that we do and who we are. God, we have placed our identity in you, placed our hope in you, placed our future in you, and we place our families in you. And God, there's a weight to that for us because we are your people and you love, our, you love your family and we love ours too. So as we feel that weight, help shift our hearts into something bigger and better and mighty. That you can do your work. That we can open our eyes, taste the strawberries, and see that you are good. Amen.